We're going to go to the island nation of Indonesia and to a volcano that erupted in December 2021 on the island there of Java called um, Semeru. So let's zoom in a little bit so we get the context here of Java. Um, you can see each of these little red triangles represents volcanoes on this island. It's a very, very volcanic island. The one that we're looking at in particular is Semeru. This volcano here. You can see the cone of it, and if we zoom back out a little bit to get some context for it here, you can see some of the settled areas nearby. Um, you don't generally tend to get people living right on the edge of the volcano, but once it starts to level off a little bit in all the fertile soils, you will get people living there. But you can already see something here that maybe is a little bit of a hint of why this is a particularly dangerous location. Now this is a time-lapse video of a webcam that monitors Semeru. There it is up near the, the summit. And this is typically the behavior that you get here. It's a very, very active volcano. And what you're looking at here is something called a paraclastic flow, which is a denser than air flow of volcanic ash and Tefran volcanic bombs mixed together with um, deadly volcanic gases that is hundreds of degrees centigrade and is traveling down far faster than you could possibly run. Now, typically, however, this happens up near the summit outside of the or not uh, in the place where people are actually living. So they're very, very used to activity, but they're not really very used to the activity coming down onto the flatter areas where they live. And then this happened on the 4th of December. You can see that something very different happened out of the ordinary. And you can see this pyroclastic flow has come off the edge of the mountain onto the flatter area where those houses were. And it's coming for the people. Now, they'll know enough about this to know that this is an absolutely deadly manifestation from any volcano. You can see them running for their lives. Not surprisingly, if something like this was bearing down upon you, I think you would probably do the same. First thing that I'm going to need to do is give you a little bit of background context to the summit of Semeru. This is it. And up towards the top of Semeru, you've got what's called a lava dome. Now let's explore that a little bit further. This is a different volcano, but it's a better picture of a lava dome. Let me try and explain to you what a lava dome is. So this is a little schematic. It's a diagram showing us the main crater, and right in the middle here we see the lava dome. And what is happening initially is that in a volcano like this, it's a composite volcano, it um, consists of magma that is extremely viscous. Um, the chemical um, reason for that, the chemistry reason, is because of the amount of silica that there is in the magma. That causes it to be very, very viscous, very, very sticky. It is not runny lava at all. So whenever it erupts at the surface, then it's too viscous to flow away easily. So it tends to form the dome within the crater. But there are two important things we need to say about this related to its viscosity. The highly viscous lava traps gases. And therefore, if you take the lid off this, the, the surface of it will harden a little bit whenever it comes out. But in underneath, it will still be semi-molten. If you take the lid off it, it tends to erupt very, very explosively. It's like shaking a can of Coke and then opening up the um, the, the can itself and the Coke will burst out. It will explode out very, very easily and very readily. The second thing is that these tend to be very unstable features. They tend to be very prone to collapse and therefore they are a lot less predictable than other aspects of volcanic activity might be. So they're explosive and they're less predictable because of their instability. A little bit of background information then about Semeru before this happened. Activity is common, it's not life-threatening. Prior to the events in December 21, Semeru was, was active. Um, there's ash plumes, those paraclastic flows that the first video showed you close to this, the summit. Late rain, or a heavy rain, sorry, in late December produced these mud flows. Um, but most of them were confined to the areas near the summit. People are used to that kind of thing. 
and therefore it's not something they typically react to. But something different happened in December. Before that, there was no enhanced seismic activity. What happens sometimes when magma is moving up through the volcano towards the surface as it forces its way through the solid rock, it will break that solid rock and trigger small earthquakes. That's one sign that a volcano might be erupting. There was none of that. As the magma builds up, then the mountain can swell a little bit. And it's actually interesting enough satellites that we use to measure those differences, differences in millimeters that can be measured by satellites orbiting the planet. Incredible. But there was none of that building up at all. So the authorities just kept the alert level at alert level two, hadn't changed it. And then something different happened in the fourth. What was it that was different? Now, this is an interesting little title, isn't it? Can the weather trigger a volcano? Now, what is it that makes a volcano erupt? Well, if I'd asked you that question, I'm pretty sure that you wouldn't have said the weather. But in actual fact, this volcanic eruption, um, we're pretty sure has a pretty strong link towards the weather. And in particular, the rain. Um, Indonesia is an area that gets a reasonable amount of rain. There is a climate graph for Indonesia, it's a wet and a dry season, but you're getting periods of time whenever there is quite a lot of rain that occurs in Indonesia. And this is the island of Java in particular. Now this over here is where you have Semeru here. And um, most of these higher rainfall areas are located where you have your volcanoes. They're mountains. Mountains tend to be higher rainfall areas anyway. So if you take a look at this area of Semeru, it's um, you know over 2,000, maybe up to 3,500 millimetres of rain falling. There's a lot of rain that falls in this area, typically anyway. <coughs> so what happened in December 2021 was that there was a period of particularly intense rain that fell over Indonesia for a number of days. This is some other satellite imagery, which is showing that the intensity of the rain and it was that intensity of the rain that led to the possible connection here that scientists are discussing so let's explore that and see what it is that might be the link so here we have the summit of semeru here is the lava dome and we had very very heavy intense rain and what the scientists think happened was that, that intense rain was enough to cause the lava dome to collapse. The surface of it, which is cooled and hardened enough to contain the lava underneath, the surface of it suddenly gave way and it was like taking the cork out of a bottle of champagne. And immediately the pressure was reduced on the gas, the gas expanded and it erupted out very, very explosively. It took the magma and pulverized it into that volcanic ash, or tephra as it's called. <coughs> and it sent an ash plume way, way up into the sky. But there was an awful lot of rain was falling then, of course, remember. And what the ash tended to do then was to mix with the rain and it precipitated down onto the ground underneath. And what that then did, uh, or sorry, I should say, at the same time as the ice going up, there was this pyroclastic flow that came down as well. The, the denser material that was too dense to be taken up into the atmosphere was went down um, the side of the mountain in that video that you saw. But the rain precipitating out the ash led to a major downpouring of water-soaked ash onto the ground, which produced this devastating large and mud flows and um, this is just a little graphic that explains what i've just said in a little bit more detail you can refer to that later here's the mud flow in action <laughs> So you can see from that, it is like a flood, it's like a river in extreme flood, but it mixed in with there is the volcanic ash. It's traveling at dozens of miles per hour. So if you're swept away with that, oh my 
get this. You don't stand a chance. It'll also, whenever it impacts into anything, will very often damage infrastructure and buildings. But basically, it has consistency of wet cement. Um, so it is extremely dangerous. It's the kind of thing that if you get caught up in it, not just the current is going to be really dangerous, but the consistency of it's going to be really dangerous as well. And you can be trapped in it. And more than that, this stuff that's up here is not smoke. Um, it's not dust. It's it's um, evidence of the temperatures, the condensation coming off the, the water here. This t started temperature around about 600 degrees centigrade as it flows down, it cools quickly. But this is close to boiling. Uh, at this stage, if you fall into that, you fall into scalding hot water. It's extremely, extremely dangerous and very, very devastating. And in this case, very much linked to the weather conditions that were occurring there at the time. Okay, let's link this then into our satellite images. Um, so this is one that you've seen before. This is the spectral signature for vegetation. You will remember, no doubt, that vegetation reflects most of the light energy in the near infrared band. Let's take a wee look then at what the paraclastic flow material or the lahar material will look like. Uh, it's similar to the spectral signature for soil, that kind of signature. So you can see that in the visible wavelengths of light, they, they are quite close. But whenever you move into the near infrared, you start to get a major difference emerging there. So if we image this in near infrared, if we image this in false color, then we should be able to tell the difference between the vegetation and the paraclastic clothes that much easier. So let's try this out. This is a, um, <clears throat> an image from before the eruption. Uh, if you're doing this on the EO browser, this is the date I'd recommend you, you look at. There's a lot of cloud in Indonesia, a lot of rain, so there's a lot of cloud. So finding cloud-free images is challenging. So this is the 12th of October is the first good cloud-free image before the eruption I could find. Similar to the one that we looked at, there's the summits. There's where you have some of the other buildings and the paraclastic flows from before and the horse from before. You can see it to a degree. My goodness, it jumps out so much more when you go into the false color, the near infrared. The red, there's the vegetation, and you can see the settlements down here, and you can pick out all of the, the darker um, paraclastic flows, lahars, and things like that coming down. But let's then move on to see if we can look at something from after the eruption. Now, this is our um, true color image again. And you can definitely see the paraclastic flow that's come down there. But if we image that in false color, you can see just how much more readily that stands out. And we can see the area is affected. And there is the area you can draw on a line as easily as that. And we can compare, uh, do a compare before and after. You can see the area that has been devastated. Now, this is where remote sensing can be used in a relief operation afterwards, whenever we try to figure out uh, what the devastation has been caused. Some of these areas can, will be very inaccessible. In this particular case, the Lahore damaged one of the major bridges, getting communications or damaging communications in and out and was making it difficult. So the remote sensing data very often is some of the first data that comes in that allows you to see the extent of the area under damage. But there's another wavelength of light that's very useful when it comes to exploring volcanoes. And that's when we move on to the shortwave infrared, SWIR. And this time it's bands four, and the visible wavelength of light, band eight, which we had in the last image, but also band 12. We're gonna see something that band 12 re reveals that adds value to it. <clears throat> so here is our false color image again. Okay, so this is our near infrared. I want you to watch this area up here. This is the summit. Do you see this black line here? I wonder, do we know what that black line is? A little bit hard to make out the difference between that and say some of these river valleys. But let's go on to the shortwave infrared. And do you see the difference? What we're able to do with the shortwave infrared is it's able to pick up a lot more reflectance of light resulting from the heat that's in the lava. So that little black thing there that looks very similar to that 
is actually the lava flow. So what happened was that the summit lava dome collapsed. Some of the lava flowed down. Most of it was pulverized into the ash and the pyroclastic flow that came down here. Um, but what we can see with this is very much uh, get an indication of the nature of the eruption that took place.